Welcome to Brainstorm, where we give you a glimpse into the world of science for this Monday, September 24, 2012. We begin with an update from the world of genetics as it applies to agriculture. Research led by Michigan State University has identified a gene with great potential for better genetically engineered plants. But before we get into a controversial method of plant modification, we need to discuss the method that nobody really minds, cultivation. In particular, the tomato. Because it turns out, humans have bred out some very beneficial traits when turning wild tomatoes into domestic ones. You see, tomatoes and other plants have tiny hair-like appendages called trichomes that serve a number of functions, including defense. Among the many specialized chemicals that trichomes secrete are axle sugars, which naturally repel pests. Not much was known about axle sugar formation, but that it's far more abundant in wild tomatoes. This research has found the first gene involved in this process, which may lead to the development of more pest-resistant domestic tomatoes. It could be done with slow breeding methods, selected for increased levels of axle sugar production, or with relatively fast genetic engineering, and in this case, a GMO would be closer to the nature than the conventional crop. So the question is, if boosting this gene works for tomatoes, why not other crops? There's an entire group of plants, including potatoes, eggplants, and peppers, that could benefit from axle sugar production, which only occurs in the trichomes. As an added bonus, study of this gene expression has broader GMO implications because it could allow scientists to express any added genes in the trichomes only, not the edible portion of the crop. Next is a story from the world of neuroscience. The Blue Brain Project out of Switzerland has made significant progress in the development of neurocircuitry computer models. The Blue Brain Project is attempting to do what many fields are doing, take the vast amount of very specific data and turning that into a useful computer. With the overall goal of stimulating entire brains, starting with simpler animals but eventually moving on to the human brain, a critical step toward that goal is understanding how synapses form. To review, synapses are the crystal points of near contact between neurons, allowing an electrical impulse to pass from the dendrites of a neuron to the axon of the next. A major question was, how do synapses form? Do the branches of neurons grow and connect randomly, or perhaps neighboring cells emit chemical signals to guide synapse formation? So to test this out, the BBP team reconstructed thousands of different neurons in the computer, based on over 20 years of data examining brain tissue. They then created a model with 10,000 of these virtual neurons in random locations and orientations to map out where the synapses end up. Comparison with real neural circuitry showed that the model was between 75 and 95 percent accurate, and this suggests that for the most part, neurons grow physically independent of each other. However, there were some exceptions where synapse formation seemed statistically guided, but that adding those to the model's parameters could make it even more accurate. Ultimately, this is a big advancement towards stimulating neural structures and our understanding of the brain. Our final story comes from the world of evolution. A study by University of Illinois scientists have compared proteins from more than 1,000 organisms and constructed a surprising tree of life. In taxonomy, the broadest categories of life are domains consisting of archaea, bacteria, and eukarya. Scientists have a fairly good understanding of when these domains formed in the history of evolution, but what about viruses? They're often not even considered alive, and there are many ideas on how they originally evolved. More importantly, what about giant viruses, which are a thing? Not only are giant viruses physically larger, but considerably more complex, containing genomes larger than some very simple bacteria. And if that didn't blur the lines enough, viruses are genetically defined by the fact that they are just genetic material inside a protein shell, and need to hijack protein-making machinery to replicate. Giant viruses, on the other hand, actually contain some enzymes necessary for the translation of proteins. To find out if these viruses fit in the tree of life, scientists didn't compare genetics, but instead protein structure. When analyzing such a wide range of lives, genetic sequences can vary greatly, but the folding structures of key proteins are more stable. Using this technique, these scientists found that the giant virus enzymes were common to pretty much all organisms, suggesting the proteins were ancient. This study produced a tree of life with four distinct branches instead of the conventional three, and has interesting implications for virus evolution. These findings support the idea that viruses actually evolved from more complex free-living organisms, a primitive microbe developing into something like a giant virus, and that further simplifying into the more conventional viruses we know of. 
Well, hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please consider subscribing and be sure to check the links in the video description.